Let's begin by recalling the definition of natural transformation, as the diagrams already indicate. So remember that we're going to consider um, the family of functors between two given categories. So this is symbolically a set of functors. between our two categories. And if you remember, if you um, recall some, some definitions from, from previous lectures, we saw that the category of categories is itself a category. So I failed to give it a name because I left it as an exercise, but let me just recall that what I mean by this is if we define cat as the category of cats, not the category of the animals, but the category of categories, um, as the family of all categories with functors as morphisms between them, and with functors as arrows, then what I mean by this notation is simply this notation. So, so this, is, this cat is the, the category in which the objects are categories themselves, and arrows are the functors that we find in the second lecture. Okay. So what we're doing by looking at the possible functors between two given categories is, remember, in the picture, in the categorical picture of a category and its objects, what we're looking at is at the collection of all arrows connecting two given objects. It's just that now we're in a somehow a, a higher step of abstraction, and we're taking two categories and all the possible natural arrows between them, which are the, the functors. So, so these things are the same. I mean, it's the same notation and just um, somehow tidying up the notation that I, I introduced for the sake of consistency with, with the previous material. OK. So OK, let's, let's, let's uh, introduce again uh, natural transformation just briefly. So remember that the notion of natural transformation appears when we look at this family of, of functors. This is, remember, this is a family of all the possible functors between the categories. And we, again, this sort of degenerate way of thinking of even more abstraction, we take these arrows now as our objects. And we're going to try and think of arrows between these arrows. And remember that those are the arrows between the arrows of the categories. So we are doing the arrows of the arrows of the arrows, which is fine. Everything is fine. So the notion, I mean, OK, let's reflect that we, we're doing the arrows of the arrows of the arrows by writing double arrows. So yes, we do something a, bit, a little bit special, but not too much. So remember that the idea of a natural transformation was to think of our, our functors between two fixed categories as objects in some uh, uh, hypothetical category. And the natural transformation will be the arrow of that, the notion of morphism in that uh, category. So taking the space of arrows of, of, um, of this category of categories, and then taking those things as objects, and then define a categorical structure. Okay? I'm just saying the same thing over and over just to, for you to see that this is a bit of gymnastics, but we're not doing anything to complicate it. It's just sort of employing the basic definitions over and over again. OK, so let's see. Let's just di diagrammatically um, depict how, how this is. What happens when I have a function? So what happens is that objects get sensible. OK, so let's introduce the color code. I think it's going to be useful. So let's turn up this thing with an F. So what happens is that objects get sent to objects. So this is the image under F of P. This is the image under F A. And of course, we also have the arrows themselves being mapped with a function. So this is, uh, let me write it here. This is the image of the arrow F under the function F. So, similarly, because I'm, I'm considering two functors of 
two fixed, uh, between two fixed categories, I'll have the similar story for these guys. This is G. And G, of course, maps the same way. Maps the objects to the objects and the arrows to the arrows. So what we want is to give the notion of an arrow from F to G. So this, this diagram here gives us, or, or somehow suggests, a possibility for an arrow between functors simply as, OK, these pairs of objects will, in general, be different if these two functors are different. So the only way that we have to connect objects in a category is via the arrows of that category. So having a natural transformation between F and G will correspond to being able to relate being able to relate these two objects in this particular direction because we want arrows to be directed. It's no problem then we want to define the equivalent thing from G to the F, but for now we want the direction. And remember from our third lecture that there's a natural property to ask from this kind of diagram. And that is that the two possible arrows that could be composed here, going through this upper path, where we go from FA to FB and then to GB, so composing um, this arrow to this one, will be a different arrow in principle from going from this bottom path, where I go from FA to GA and then to GB. So demanding that this diagram commutes means that these two arrows are the same and that I have the, a commuted diagram. So only the arrows that are uh, displayed on the diagram are the arrows that are different in the category. Okay? So the way, the way we're going to formalize this, this notion is by uh, giving the definition of um, think. I'm done with colors. It's going to be by definition of natural transformation. So an alpha is going to be actually a, a collection of morphisms from the pairs of objects uh, mapped with the two different morphisms that we're trying to, to relate. And this is going to be for every object in my category. Right, so this is the basic information. This is basically the, the bag of all the yellow arrows here that will allow me to close the diagram. And the condition that, the, 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 that all these diagrams are uh, commutative is written more explicitly here as, um, well, actually, you can see it very explicitly here. So in here, I have the alpha for the object A. And in here, I have the alpha for the object B. So it's, it's in this diagram that I can impose the condition that um, the natural transformation family of maps can use or make the diagram make the diagram to use. Very well. Okay, so this is a reminder of the notion of natural transformation. Any questions about the notation or the basic definition? Okay. So the one thing I wanted to talk about that I didn't have the time to cover yesterday in a, a little bit more detail and um, somehow commenting a bit more about the subtleties in the interpretation is the notion of isomorphism and, and why um, it's not reasonable to think of equality in a category as your notion of equivalent somehow. So remember that when we introduced categories uh, on, uh, on our first lecture, we said these are collections of objects, that we call them objects to refer to the abstract nature of these things, that can be anything, and the only thing that matters is that we have this arrow structure that allows us to interpret diagrams and sort of walking from one to the other and composing paths and so on. Um, and we said, well, equality in this context is going to be a, a very philosophically unstable notion because for the exposition, equality meant that the two symbols had the same, so the, the two objects had the same symbol uh, denoting them. So obviously that's a very unsatisfying uh, notion of equality. We want equality to be 
characterized in a, in a more formal way. And so throughout today's lecture, which is the final basic lecture on basic category theory that I'm going to give to you in the summer school, I, I want to emphasize this notion of um, the structural um, relatedness of categories. So categories emphasize the relations between objects, so the, the, the connectivity and the directionality of relations between objects. And it's that what gives the characteristics of a category. Is that what essentially gives you the information of the structure of a category? Not so much how objects are distributed or how they operate in more algebraic ways. It's, it's more about how they relate to each other. So in the second half of the lecture, we will introduce a, a first example of what is called a universal property. So if any of you um, are familiar with any, any form of abstract algebra, maybe you've heard of the, the term universal property. Many times it's referred to when a tensor product is introduced, and if a lecturer has the, de has the decency to you know, refer to what is the definition of tensor product, they will say, well, this is defined with a universal property, and they will basically leave it at that. So the, ten the universal property of the tensor product is, is quite subtle for an introductory call. Of course, so what I'm, I'm going to do today is give you the, the um, universal property of a categorical product, which is a categorical uh, generalization of the Cartesian product of sets. And you, there you will see this idea that we give a definition of uh, a, category, a, a, category, a categorical notion, so some structure, some uh, object, or perhaps not object, but some construction within a category, by essentially saying, if I have arrows to this object, I want to characterize what happens when I have arrows from that object to every other, every other object, or from every other object to that object. Okay? So our emphasis is on how those objects relate to all the, all the other objects. If we want to identify special objects in a category, we, we need to say how all the possible arrows going from them or, or to them um, um, are going to be found, found in the category. Okay. So that said, let's think of one particular example of category to exemplify this uh, instability of equality versus isomorphism. I'm going to throw a question, and feel free to answer in Spanish if you want. Um, but I think all of you will have an answer. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't have a correct or, or incorrect answer, and I want you to give me some, some answers. I want, I want you to tell me what, what a sphere is, in particular a two-sphere. Someone give me the most mathematically precise definition you can think of of a sphere. It doesn't need to be, uh, you know, some little form of it. Definiciones de la esfera, de las dos esferas. ¿Cómo definís las dos esferas? Las dos esferas. No. ¿Dimensión dos has dicho? Sí, dos esferas, en tres dimensiones. Acá es la cáscara de una bola. Ah, pues el conjunto de puntos que están a la misma distancia. Ok, ¿en qué espacio? En R3. En R3. R3, vale. R lo identificamos con un espacio que conocemos bien. R3, tenemos un, una, una distancia, ¿no? ¿Alguna definición más? Si no tengo una distancia, no puedo hacer eso. O sea, también lo puedo definir como topológicamente, ¿no? Como en plan, superficie compacta de género cero algo así. Muy bien. So yeah, that, that's that's the direction I was I was aiming for. So there's there's what is the, the two sphere? Is it in a, in a fixed space with a fixed metric? Is it radius one, radius two? What is the radius of the sphere? Is it you know if I deform the sphere a little bit, is it still topologically sphere? So if I'm talking about topology, can can you distinguish between a sphere and you know a complicated shape that is still the same topological genus? You can't. So the idea that we mathematicians and physicists and scientists give names to things and give one single symbol to a notion, it's somehow kind of misleading because you know, we're, we're very quick to say, oh, we have this symbol, that's simple. It's very simple. Everyone understands the same. But you know, if, if I write the symbol for sphere, the conventional symbol for sphere, S2, on the blackboard, depending what kind of mathematician or, or, or scientist is looking at this, they will understand completely different things. And they will all be correct in their, in their own sense. It's not that they are worse or better in understanding the spheres. They will just have completely different notions of mathematically rigorous definitions of sphere. And you know, the, the, the topology case is, I think, the most illustrative, that we have all these 
different definitions of what sphere is. So for example, sphere is the one point compactification of any Euclidean space, or in this case, the three dimensional Euclidean space, or in fact, any space homeomorphic to an Euclidean space. It's also the, the, the locus of any monotonically increasing function in some, in some metric space, like the radius and this kind of thing. So there's all these different ways to define a sphere, and it really depends on what you mean but how things are similar in that category, hence the name category theory, um, that gives the notion of a sphere as something, something precise, as, some, as something rooted. Um, so it, it is in the sense that, for example, if you're doing differential geometry and you're particularly thinking of metrics and, and Riemannian metrics on spheres, you, then you definitely don't have one single canonical definition of sphere. Because how do you choose what, what is your model sphere, unless you artificially say, this is my model sphere, and you point, it, point to it, there's no notion of what is the one natural sphere. You would say, well, I have a class of manifolds that are diffeomorphic, or you know, have a topological continuous mass between them, and they have different metrics. They have, as we manifolds, manifolds, they are different. You know, if you want to walk on them, the experience will be different. But in, in a topological sense, or in a you know, differentiable topological sense, they will be the same space because they will all be diffeomorphic. So they will be isomorphic within the category of topological spaces, but it will, they will be not isomorphic in the category of Riemannian manifolds, for example. Right? And so it's, it's this idea that you really need to make precise what you mean by morphism in a, in a certain context for you to, to speak of the objects in the first place with some precision. So when I write S2 on the blackboard, or A in a category, now we're going back to categories, enough geometry. Um, so when I, when I write down a symbol for a, for a particular mathematical notion, you know, it's not entirely clear what I mean just by that symbol, and, and by that symbol, unless I, I give you some structure of how to think of when things are similar enough that you can say, okay, they, they are interchangeable for this particular notion of relatedness or sameness, right? So, or similarity somehow. So this is, this is the notion of isomorphism, and we already covered isomorphisms at a more formal level, just you know, formal definition as the existence of a pair of arrows in the category, such that, because in a category we always have the identities, remember? We never write them because they're always there. Um, this direction, G. So, Demanding that this, these two maps compose um, the, the arrow from A to A and B to be precisely like the identities is what we define as, as an isomorphism. And I will use a, a symbol that you're probably very familiar with. We say that, that, that they are isomorphic objects within this category. And I want to be pedantic and say this, this, these objects are isomorphic in the category A. And it's crucial to say, and I, I hope that my previous rant about spheres uh, gave you a sense why it's important to say in which category things are isomorphic. Because obviously, if you're, if you're walking on Venus or on Earth or on Jupiter, you know, your experience is going to be very different if, if you want to reach from one pole to the other. And they are all topological spheres. So if you're just a topologist and you want to do some you know, uh, astrophysical studies, you're going to have a very bad time. <laughs> Um, if you think that Jupiter and, and Mars are essentially the same. So it's very important to, to, to specify that. But in any case, we do have this notion in a category. So this is, in, in our convention, we said that equality in a category is very strict. It's as strict as basically saying this, this object is the only thing that we can distinguish from anything similar to it. But then we have this more flexible and, and more natural, and the key word here is natural, notion of isomorphism, where we can see um, objects in a category that are naturally similar for the specific characteristic that we are interested in. So that's the, and, and I hope that this uh, is helping you realize what categories are. Categories are a symbolic game of arrows and points, yes. They can be seen as just games, but this is more conceptually what categories are. Categories are a choice of what are the relevant aspects of certain mathematical constructions that allow you to identify what sameness means or similarity means between different, different elements of those, or different kinds of those mathematical constructions. 
Um, so when, when I ask you for examples, most of the most of the hard work requ required to um, come up with good examples of categories is to think of probably familiar stuff that you've already considered in your life before, but you have to look at them in a particular from a particular angle and think, okay, we're going to look at this particular property of these particular objects. And, and, and then the notion of morphism is usually very natural uh, from that point. Okay, so enough with this more uh, sort of philosophical discussion. And everything to say that whenever we have a category, we have a notion of isomorphism within that category. Okay, and it is that notion that of what the similarity of objects is. is is really about in, in the context of category theory. Okay, so back to our <coughs> discussion about <coughs> natural transformations and, and fun. So we have defined the category of all categories whose arrows are just the fun first. And now we have identified that if we fix two, two categories, we have the notion of a natural transformation. So this uh, notation here, perhaps I can refine a little bit my comments by saying that it is the objects of, of this, which is the category of all the functors between, between two given categories, um, the objects are all the functors between the two fixed objects, hence the notation reflecting explicitly the two fixed categories. And then the arrows um, of this, so if I want to say um, two objects in here will be um, a functor from A to B and, sorry, and a functor from A to B, right? So this is, um, oh, wait, sorry. These are two objects. Remember this notation. Remember what do I have that notation here. Have the name of a category and then brackets the two objects and that means all the arrows between the objects in that category. So now I'm taking two objects of this category, which are functors between the two fixed categories, and I'm saying I'm going to write the name symbol for, for that category in, in front. So what this means is this is the set of all the arrows in this category. So what is this? Well, this is precisely all the possible natural transformations between F and G. It is set, natural transformation that we just defined. Um, so how do we write this? So fix A, B. <coughs> and fix F and G to functors. So, so this set, this collection here, is all the possible natural transformations. Okay. So all, the, so alpha, the, all, all those kind of things. Okay. Of course, by the way, um, So just bear in mind uh, that I can change these two functors. So I could I could write G here and F here, and in this larger category of bracket A B, I have trans natural transformations from G to F, but also from any any two other pairs of functors between the two fixed categories. Okay. So I want you to bear with me and, and realize that okay, so we have a notion of isomorphism of category, right? So we have a notion of sameness of two categories already because we identified the category of all categories and therefore well there is there is a notion of an isomorphism in any category in particular in the category of all categories and so I mean tiny with the notation here so, just right here um, A and B are isomorphic if I'm the right isomorphic as categories when and of course I'm just going to rewrite what I just erased which is the definition of isomorphism f and f dash between a and b with the property of isomorphism, which means um, that f dash composed with f is to compose to the identity 
in the category H, which is the identity factor. And this is the identity factor. And I So this is the notion of isomorphism of categories, but remember that what are these objects? So again, just to read you, this is the notion of isomorphism in the category of categories. Therefore, that's why I call these two um, categories isomorphic. They are isomorphic within the category of categories. But if you take to heart this definition, the fact that there is a natural notion of arrow between morphisms, and that's where the name natural transformation comes from. This is a natural notion of arrow, uh, the direction uh, between two functors. And we have identified this, this bracket AB as a category of all the functors uh, between uh, two fixed categories with the, the arrows being the natural transformations. Then you realize that if I'm, in, if I'm in this kind of situation, I'm not yet assuming that this is an isomorphism in the sense of categorized. I'm just assuming that I found two functors in this direction. I realize that. I can compose them, so f composed with f, so f dash composed with f in this way. I can, so this as a functor belongs according to that, to that notation to this, right? It's a functor from a to a. I'm just going from a to b, then back to a as a category. And similarly with the other composition. Right? So this, um, yeah. So now we have, of course, in these categories, we have the identity, the natural transformation. This, this, this kind of transformation you, you would have found in the exercise when you proved that these arrows are, between functors are indeed uh, arrows of some, of some category. We also have the identity functors in here. Uh, that, uh, sorry, the, yes, the identity functors, the functors that basically do nothing. So now we are at the, in the position to say, okay, so we have two elements, two different elements. Let's, let's focus on A at first. We have two different elements of a given category, which is the categories of all the functors, all the other functors, this is the usual name, all the functors of A onto itself. So the, 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 the natural thing to impose is not that they are equal, because remember, we were justifying why equality is, is unreasonably strict uh, for this notion. So what is the natural condition to impose here? That these two functors that belong to this category of all the, all the, all the uh, functors between, between the, uh, from the category itself are isomorphic within that category, not necessarily equal. Right? And so um, we want to impose, uh, let me Keeping the diagram all the time, but I hope everyone sees. Right, so here. Let's say um, A and B are equivalent. Is the the other notion that I was referring to yesterday, didn't have time to elaborate. If I'm basically going to copy the same thing, I'm going to use a different symbol, it has one less um, little dash for the equal sign, and well, I'm essentially copying what's called there. But now what I impose is that. F, F dash is isomorphic in this category to the identity function. Uh, F dash F, I'm copying again. Oh, is isomorphic in this category to the identity function. Would everyone follow my definition of the equivalent category? Because this, is, I think, this is what um, exemplifies the, the, the philosophy of, of the categorical way of thinking. Uh, this is the level of the sure. No, I'm not sure. Time. 
書けばよろしそれは、私たちの2つの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意味があるので、私たちの意
So there's a phi 1 that goes to the first factor, and there's a phi 2 that goes to the second factor. Again, this is probably already suggesting the Cartesian product, but for now, I'm just giving you a categorical definition. I'm just saying you take two objects, associate the third one, and that third one needs to carry two arrows to the two previous objects. That's what I'm saying. I'm just using the categorical structure. The category is the objects or all the category? Mm -hmm. Es decir, que cuando dices A, B, pertenecientes a la caligráfica, <laughs> es, ¿es la categoría o la familia de objetos? La familia de objetos. It's, 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 it, lo suponía, pero tenía que preguntarte, ¿no? Yes. As usual, we are doing the, uh, the convention that the name of the category would use as the name of the objects. But yes, you are absolutely correct. This is the objects of um, and here, just for consistency. Completely precise, yes. Is the objects of the category, but we've been using that convention throughout this course. Okay, so we have those two maps, and then for this to be a categorical product, we're going to, we're, we're going to impose is what's called the universal property. And this will be, unfortunately, the only example I have time to give you of a universal property construction in, 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 in a category. But I think it's a, it's a good one, and it's, it's an illustrative one, and it's very simple. So, the universal property. As the name suggests, universal property, it, it's saying something that our product needs to satisfy with respect to everything else in the category. It needs to be universal with respect to everything else in the category. So, what that means is, let me, I have a third object here, I have A and B. And I take their categorical product. So I have four objects in total. According to, to this, uh, first, uh, this first um, um, element of, of our construction, we have an assignment of objects for any pair of objects in the category. So we have these three objects. And now let's consider a, a, a third unrelated object in our category. This could be any other object in the category. So of course, sorry, for, from the second line of our definition, we know that we have the projections, right? And then what we say is, okay, for all arrows, okay, if there are no arrows, let's be a bit more intuitive. If there are no arrows between C and, and A, which is possible, because we are not in a category, then there's nothing else to say. There's, not, there's, there's no possibility to demand anything. But there's no interaction between C uh, and A and B, they don't talk to each other at all. But if there are arrows, and so for all the arrows that may, ex may exist between uh, C and A, um, if one third object is related to both A and B, I'm not assuming anything about this arrows. I mean, there's nothing to assume. I have no structure. This is just a category. It's like bare bones of, of a formal structure. There's nothing else to, to demand. So if I have two arrows between an, an arbitrary third object that are connected, connecting C to A and C to B, <laughs> then it's natural to demand that, okay, there should be an arrow from C to this construction. So I want that there should be uh, um, an arrow from, from the third object to the product. Because somehow, if the information, if the categorical information of the two objects gave me the product, and the categorical information told me that C is connected to A by a little A, and C is connected to B by a little B, I want to demand that my, my, my definition of categorical product is such that, that that information is enough to say that C is in fact related or connected to the construction by a, a man. Okay? And can anybody guess what I'm gonna, demand for this. So what I'm demanding first of all is that there's exi there exists a unique C uh, mapping, let me say, C mapping C to A to B. There exists only one, but that's, that's, that's very um, oblivious. So, I mean, okay, this is, this is um, so somehow motivated by, by this fact, but I also have these two arrows. So can anybody, anybody guess what I'm gonna demand? for this C, that must be unique. 
Efectivamente. That means that this is commutative. And this diagram is commutative. That going from C to B via little b is the same as going from C to B through A times B. And similarly for this other half of the diagram. And I could have defined a product of n different objects just by giving n different projections. And, and so we demand that this exists and, and it's unique. And uh, this diagram commutes. Remember, we use this symbol hashtag thing here. Uh, so this commutes. Okay, so that's the definition of categorical product. Quite easy. So this, this could be left as an exercise. I'm going to do it here, essentially. Um, and the exercise is to, to, sh to show that when the category is set, so what is set? Set is the family of all sets, and the arrows are just the maps between the sets, or the uh, map uh, for the pointless elements. OK? So your, your exercise is to show that set with x Cartesian product is a categorical product. So that's the exercise. I think this needs to go. Um, so that's the exercise, and that's the end of my category theory course. Let me just give you a sketch of why this works. I mean, what I wrote here is essentially the definition of the Cartesian product in some sense. Um, the, the only thing that is not explicit is how C is determined by, by A and B. In a, in a general category, what I had to use, because I didn't have, to, actually, let me use this last five minutes to do this a bit more concrete. So imagine that now that diagram, everything else is the same. And in sets, I, I take two sets, I create a new one with a product, and then two maps that work. So what are, what are the, the maps? Uh, remember that, C, uh, sorry, that A times B, or sets, is just the set of all the pairs. Um, this is that. Um, X and Y. In, it's the set of all the pairs such that X is in A and Y is in B. Right? So. I have a natural projection, hence the names, to each of the factors because I can project to the first factor, factor from here, A, singly, because if you give me a pair of numbers, I can give you, you know, I know how to count, so I know what's the first and I know uh, what's the second. Right? So I can, because I know the structure, how these things are defined uh, with elements of sets, I know that I can project them down. Right? So in this case, the projections are simply, the, they simply reflect how I constructed the, the Cartesian product in the first place. Okay. And actually, the, uh, everyone's familiar with this, but perhaps what people are, might be less familiar with is the universal property of the Cartesian product. Because nobody, I mean, except here, very few people care about the universal property of the Cartesian product, which is usually not. That interesting uh, to think about. But it's there, it's definitely there. So what does the universal property say? It says that when I have this diagram, set phi, set C into, so there's a map A into set A, set C, there is a map B into set B. I take the Cartesian product, these two sets, which carry the canonical projections, What is the universal property? So the universal property says that there should exist a unique map from uh, C to the Cartesian product such that those diagrams commute. So one way to show that this is the case is to construct the map explicitly. I have explicit, explicitly means as a map of sets. Um, I have explicit, explicit expressions for, or explicit constructions for the projections. So why not give explicit construction for, for this map C. Does anyone know 
how to, as you've seen this before, otherwise refrain yourself from answering. Does anyone know, has an idea how to define C? It's a puzzle. You have some ingredients, you want something to happen, you can combine them in very limited ways. So there's no many possibilities to make mistakes. Podrías hacer la composición de la inversa de la proyección. Las proyecciones no tienen inversa. Son, son subjetivas. Sí. No, no, no podemos a priori. Esto no existe en general. Notice that the information you must use is A and B. Effectivamente. So that's what's usually called the Cartesian product of maps. So C is what in the literature is written as this, and what it means is C acting an arbitrary element is given by the pair A in that element on that element. It's a very silly definition. I did not, but this is, it is a map, it's a well-defined map, and what's mo most important is that if I take the first component, which means projecting, I get the image under A, which is this triangle commuting. So if I take the second component, the second one, which is this other triangle commuting. Okay, so that's, the hidden universal property in the Cartesian product uh, that gives the uh, motivation for this more general. But here the, the punchline is that in a category, because we don't have access to this level of somehow granularity, we don't have access to projections telling us how elements um, behave and so how the sort of fine structure of our objects behaves, we need to resort to this other philosophy. We need to resort to the level of how does the object as a whole relate to other objects in my category? And when that information is known, I need to, to impose that that information is enough to determine uh, the, the relation between that new object that I, I define to any other potential object that might be related to the, to the other two that are constructed here. Okay? That is uh, what every year I try to, uh, to tell you, but really in two hours in Portugal this year, I managed to put a universal property in the black person map. That's the end of my question. Thank you.